Hi, this is Roger, thanks for dropping by. You've heard me mentioning back over the days that I've got a talk to do this Saturday. This is it. <laughs> it has, I must admit, been hastily put together because it wasn't the talk I'd planned on doing, which is a little annoying, but that's how things go. Um, the, the, the talk I wanted to do was seasonal care of dendrobiums and it was planned to be taking place in September, so I'd have had all of the season to get all the clips together, which I will still do, but um, the talk has been moved to now, this Saturday, so I've had to change the subject. And um, I've put a talk together, I said it's been, it's been relatively hastily put together. Um, it does sidetrack slightly in places, but it's all about um, the compromises we make to try and grow orchids. You know, um, <laughs> and I'll take you through it. Now, when I do this for real, there'll obviously be no soundtrack. It'll just be the pictures up on the, projected up on the screen, and I'll talk along with it, um, you know, with the microphone and all that stuff. So I'll narrate the, the pictures as they go along. But for YouTube, um, I'll do a soundtrack, add it to the video, and do that just for YouTube. The idea is that you get to see it, you know, you're not deprived because you're not a member of the Orchid Society. You still get to see the talk and you help me out by looking at words. So where there's text on the screen, you're looking at, are they the right words? Are they spelt right? Have I missed a word out? Have, have I done something daft? Because I can't, I can't proofread it myself. I'm not very good at doing that. I proofread somebody else's stuff but not my own, I'm afraid. That's just how my brain works. So you help me out by finding any mistakes that are there. Um, if I did the soundtrack to this video 10 times, it would be 10 different soundtracks because it's as I think of it, as the pictures come up in front of me, although there are like themes and guidelines that I'm gonna talk along with. So uh, let me know what you think. You haven't got long. Um, what's now? It's Thursday, uh, Thursday mid-morning. Um, by the time I've put the soundtrack on and got the rest of this together and got it up on YouTube, it's going to be late on Thursday. Not evening, I mean late Thursday afternoon probably. And I've got to have time to make any changes that you suggest. So, um, you know, if you're, going to, if, if you're going to watch it sort of thing, most of my views take place when I'm in bed, basically. They take place from mid-evening UK time till early morning UK time. So um, you'll, you'll have tonight and a fair bit of tomorrow to make comments and, and get your chance to view it, you know, and, and give me feedback. So here we go then. Um, obviously it will start as though I was talking to an orchid society, which is what the talk is for. So once I get out of this waffly bit and we get into the presentation proper, it will be as though I've just been introduced and you know I'm about to start the talk in front of the um, orchid society. So uh, let me know what you think. It's all good fun, isn't it? <laughs> and this is an introduction. You know what you're expecting now? You're expecting my normal music and my... Yeah, well, you're not going to get it. <laughs> It'll just go straight into the talk. See you next time. Thanks for your help. Thanks for that introduction. And uh, I must remind you this is a video presentation. So once it starts playing, it will play to the end. So please, please keep all your questions until the end so that we can do it as a continuous thing. And I'm going to circle around this strange title, The Compromises Needed to Grow Various Orchid Types in Different Environments. So I'd like you to have a think, a bit of contemplation to start with. What do the next few pictures have in common? Yes, there are areas where tropical orchids would be growing. So I thought we'd start off by having a look at some, where they grow. So we're not specifically picking on pretty blooms, but where they're growing. Side of a branch. This one looks like the tree's fallen down. 
Um, but nonetheless, it was growing on a bare piece of uh, trunk. Um, this syllogeny is growing in amongst the debris and stuff quite low down near the ground. This one here is either on a rock face or a large tree, can't work out which, in the moss, growing in the moss. These are on a rock face, growing on a rock face, on a ledge, probably where there's some debris. This one is growing on a bare trunk, there's not a scrap of moss in sight. And this one has spread itself along the underside of a large branch. Wonder why? Nice syllogeny again. Um, growing up a bank, yeah, so uh, there we go. Um, Paphiopedalum growing in situ there on a ledge again, a little bit of um, leaf litter perhaps, apart from that on rocks. Uh, Cattleya type, probably a lalia, growing on a bare trunk, No, not a scrap of moss in sight. Um, this one's growing on a uh, branch with some moss, but not too much. Now this one's growing in crevices on an old gnarly tree with moss in those crevices. So that's got something to get its roots into. And then this one's growing very close to the ground, Cattleya type again. So um, yeah, and this one's growing quite near the top of a tree, but it's a moss covered tree, but it's right out in the open. And then good luck trying to find that one in the wild nowadays. Nice mossy environment, shady, Odontoglossum crispum. Um, not a lot of those about now. Right, so why have I bothered showing these? Well, I'm going to sidetrack a little bit because to me this sort of thing is important and it may be to you as well. That's why I'm showing you these orchids in these special places. Because very soon, if nothing changes, they could be gone. Because we come along and do this. So from this, we change it. And we make it look like that. And that's no good to man the beast as far as orchids are concerned. And he serves one purpose, profit. So maybe we're taking a last look at some of these places and where these orchids grow. So let's get back to the orchids themselves then. Now each one of these has found a little niche. It's found a happy place. Now orchids do the, the mass production, seed production, distributed by the wind, most of which will never germinate. So they have to find a place, first of all, where they can germinate, and then that has to be a suitable place for that type of orchid to actually grow, or it will not thrive, it will wither, it just will not survive, basically. So out of the tens or even hundreds of thousands of seeds, not many make it, but those that do are normally in just the right place. Now, looking at those places there, how many of those types of places have you got in your house? Now we get on to the subject matter. The compromises we have to make to actually be able to take some of these orchids from what is their happy place and bring them into a place that's nowhere near as happy. So we will have to make compromises. And therein we've twisted it round and got back to the subject in question. The compromises we have to make. Right, but now tongue in cheek for the moment, right? These perfect places are no good to us. We need to get closer to home. We can't have all these sort of places out in the wild. I want my orchids in my house or something like that. So we want to grow them on our windowsill so that we can have pretty coloured pots and impress our friends. And if we're in the country and we've got big thick walls and big thick windowsills, we can have lots more and impress our friends even more. And we can make special little boxes on our windowsills to hide the pots so that we just see the pretty flowers and the leaves. We might even find a little corner of the bathroom to put one in. So we'll find places to put them. But that's where the ordinary people grow their orchids. I'm a serious orchid grower. I need better places than that. I can't be doing with window sills and stuff like that. I want a better place for my orchids. So, I can find better places in my home, like tables. Yeah, and I can get away from the window. I can have some nice ornate shelves to put my orchids on, and people will take me seriously now. And I might have quite a few of these shelves, and they might have open shelving to get a bit of airflow round. 
We could even go into the specialised shelving with some lights and some fans. Now we're starting to get serious. People will take me seriously now. Uh, we could also have some pretty elaborate, sturdy, structured shelving where we can hang plants. And um, who knows? Uh, we've nearly filled the room up now, haven't we? But that's still ordinary. It's still indoors. I'm a serious orchid grower. I need an even better place than that, even though some people have got a whole room dedicated. So what else could we have? The conservatory. Now we're getting somewhere where we can have a combination of people and plants. Now, when is a lean-to greenhouse not a conservatory or vice versa? <laughs> oh dear, now you're just being silly. I don't think many have got one of those in the garden, have they? Right. Yes, but I'm a real serious orchid grower. I can't grow orchids in the house. To grow orchids properly, you've got to have one of these, or you're just not a serious orchid grower. You have to have a greenhouse. Now, they come in all shapes and sizes, from the little sort of six by eights. They can have little walls around the bottom. Um, this is good stuff. We can, we can now be a serious orchid grower. Um, these polycarbonate ones are pretty good. We can have automation, fans, humidifiers, heaters, all that sort of stuff. But it's not big enough. I need two greenhouses joined together and special layered staging to get all my plants in. Yeah, well, now you're just being silly. Now you're just being silly. But that's where the mass ones are produced. Right, but what about these compromises then? Every single one of those environments we've just looked at is not like the environment in the wild. Therefore, we're going to have to make compromises and or adapt these places to make them more suitable to be able to grow the orchids. And that will depend on what type of orchids we decide to grow. And therein you've got another compromise. Do you compromise the types of orchids you grow to suit the environment you've already got? Or do you adapt that environment to allow you more choices in the orchids that you want to grow? And sometimes it'll work and sometimes it won't. OK, let's have a chat about the things in the home. Uh, we've got light levels to talk about. They tend to be lower than natural light. We've got temperatures to talk about. We've got humidity. There's usually quite a lack of that. Airflow, well, we can provide that. Space, your plants are going to take up space in the home. Other halves, does your other half appreciate half the house being taken up with your plants? <laughs> oh dear. And then we've got pets. I've seen a whole coffee table be cleared by the tail of a German shepherd on the wag. Yeah. And then we've got children, you know, th th those pets that sort of understand us. And again, you know, well, you know, you told us not to run, Daddy, and, and, and we weren't running, and, and when we weren't running because you told us not to run, your plant fell over and broke. Children. <laughs> Love them. So all of these things we're going to have to contend with in the home. And they are environmental factors, whether we like them or not. Yeah? But within the home are lots of different places that we've already sort of gone over to some degree. You know, you've got, you've got your window sills, you've got shelves that you've already got, um, you've got shelving that you might bring in specifically for your plants, yeah? You might even set a room aside. But in the home, you're going to have to contend with all of these factors to one degree or another, and you will need to make compromises for all of those in some shape or form. Right, so let's have a think about some of these places then. We've got window sills, tables and shelves, special shelving, and we've got the whole room principle. Yeah, so each of these has its own challenges. Window sills in modern houses have usually got what underneath them? A radiator. That's going to provide warmth and hot, dry air flowing upwards, straight all over your plants. And there aren't many orchids are going to put up with that. So window sills are often crossed off the list, unless you've got some that haven't got a radiator underneath, or you do something about it 
and extend the window sill out over the top of the radiator so that the heat when it rises doesn't directly hit the plants. But a radiator under a window sill is not a good idea for orchids. Um, tables and shelves, well you put them where you want them to suit the plants so they're more adaptable than a window sill that's fixed. Um, special shelving, again you're starting to get a little bit more adapted and if you get into the whole room saga you can make that room pretty good. You can have humidity, you can have temperature control, you can have lighting control, you can get closer to the more varied orchids requirements than you can on a windowsill. The, you know, yeah, but there's still some compromises you'll be making. You've just sacrificed a whole room in your house, for instance. Um, anyway, let's have a look at a bit more detail and uh, possibly think a bit more seriously about these places. Now, windowsills in particular have restrictions. First of all, you could say, going back to the list, light. Well, there's plenty of light on the windowsill, isn't there? Yeah, well, which way is the windowsill facing? Because if it faces north, it's never going to see any sun. I'm talking UK here, yeah. So it will have good light, but it won't be really strong light. And for some orchids, that might be a little bit too low to actually get them to bloom. Oh, that's all right, then I'll put them on a south-facing window. Now you're going to burn them, because the sun's going to hit them. Well, what about an east or a west facing windowsill? Better, but in the midsummer months, the sun, when it, eat, it hits your east facing window, is going to rise rapidly because it's not really rising in the east in the midsummer. And it's going to gain strength quickly, and that could be too much for your plants first thing in the morning when they've just woken up and blinked and got their sunglasses on. So you need to take care with any orchids in any windowsill that gets direct sun. Now really early morning sun and late evening sun is okay for quite a lot of orchids and in some cases will do them the world of good. But you know again you're limiting your choice of orchids by the environment you're going to actually put them in. You're compromising. Now the perfect I suppose windowsill orchid you could say is the humble phalaenopsis humble I say, probably more variety in sizes, shapes and colours than any other orchid type on the planet, thanks to the hybridisation programmes. So you can have every colour of the rainbow, including the lovely dyed blue ones. Aren't they wonderful? Are they wonderful? No. <laughs> but these are very adaptable orchids. They will put up with the lower humidity in your home, which you've naturally got, whether you like it or not. And... Um, they'll put up with the sort of light levels that you can get on a north facing window and still bloom okay. But your compromise is you've just removed your ability to put your pictures of your kids, have somewhere for your cat to sleep in the sunshine, you know all the knickknacks that you love to pick up and dust under every week. Of course you people don't dust do you? You have people that come round and do that for you. <laughs> tongue in cheek I'm only joking um, but yes you know a windowsill dedicated to orchids cannot be used for anything else so you've sacrificed space in your home you've made a compromise but you've got some lovely orchids and they're in your home and you can see them because they're in your home now that's not a compromise that's a bonus because some of the other places we're going to talk about, you won't see your orchids unless you put your hat and coat on and go and find them. Because they're down the bottom of the garden. So, window sills are good for some types of orchids, depending on the light level. You could introduce a little fan, give a bit of airflow, but for Phalaenopsis you won't really need it. The temperatures in your home, choose orchids that like those temperatures. So, north facing room with no heat. You can go for some cooler growers, and some of those cooler growers are shady orchids, Mazda Valleys, things like that, but they will want humidity or they're not going to be happy. So, you, you know, you're compromising, you're choosing orchid types to fit an environment that you've already got, and you can get away to a degree without adapting it. Do I... <laughs> That's my phone, forget that. Um... Do I grow orchids in the home? Well, yes, I've got one windowsill that hasn't got a radiator under it in the kitchen. 
So that's where my little group of Phalaenopsis live. Now these were bought for a specific project for my YouTube channel because I don't normally grow these because they don't do very well in the grow room. It's too cold in the winter. But in the home it's not too cold in the winter because the night temperatures don't drop down. So I do have a few Phalaenopsis on the kitchen window sill. It faces directly north. It never sees the sunshine but it's a bright window, more than enough light to get these to bloom, well, as you can see. And there's some extra humidity now and again from hot water, kettles boiling, cooking and all that sort of stuff. Works pretty good. So there we go. Right, tables and shelves. What you've got now is the ability to choose a place that's movable. So it's not like a windowsill that's fixed. Um, you will use space in your home and you will perhaps use a table that once you used to have your meals on and now you can't or you used to put your coffee and your book on and now you can't but if you have um, specific shelving then it's dedicated for the use of your orchids and um, you can get very ornate shelving that looks pretty good and fits in with the decor of your home the only problem you've got really is you've now moved probably away from the window by definition um, and you've chosen a place for your orchids because of where you want them not for where it's best for them. So the problem you've got now is you've probably lost your natural light to a degree. So what do we do? We compromise. We choose very low light orchids that will be okay. Unfortunately, an awful lot of those low-light orchids are also um, rainforest orchids and they like to stay pretty cool and they like quite high humidity. You don't tend to get that environment in your lounge, do you? <laughs> so again, we're looking at compromising. So what do we do? Well, if we want to increase the light level, we'll need some artificial lighting. And again, you can get very ornate grow lights that would fit in with your decor. You can get timers, if you're not there, to actually switch them on and off. Um, and you can have a special place for your orchids where you want them and you compensate the lack of light by having some artificial lighting. And if you've got shelving like that, you might even be able to have a little home humidifier that gives them a bit of humidity. Um, you might be able to have a little fan rigged up to get a little bit of airflow. So, is this better than a windowsill? We're getting there, aren't we? If you think about it, we've now got a place where, although we might need to compromise, we can overcome the compromises and adapt. Orchids are adaptable. Well, we have to be adapt adaptable as well. We've got to have a go at it. <laughs> you know? um, so anyway, we're, we're now getting to a place that might be a bit better for our orchids than the, just the windowsill. More variety, more shapes, more sizes, possibly more colours by being adaptable. Okay, let's have a think about special shelving. And all I mean now is that you've got something very, very specific for the orchids. It's probably going to be tailored to where you want to put it as far as its size, its height, and it's probably going to take up a large amount of space, possibly a whole wall or something like that. Or like in this case, in front of a really large window. You're still in the home, you still get to see your orchids, but you'll have a variety of places to put them now where you might have some hanging racks. And in addition to that, when you start getting the more elaborate shelving like this, you can have attachments for LED lights, for fans, possibly even a heater, you know, uh, but in the home, you don't normally have to worry about temperatures. Um, but yeah, this is a more elaborate setup rather than the just store-bought you know, proposed shelving that's not necessarily for orchids. This is where you're thinking more about, I want some shelving just for my orchids. I want it special, you know, because uh, the ordinary people use those sorts of shelves. I want some special shelving because I'm a serious orchid grower. <laughs> I can't do it without laughing. Um, anyway, that's what I mean by special shelving. You're going to place it in a position that you've chosen and you're going to design everything around your orchids based on those shelves shelves, their heights, their width, 
their placement and all the attachments that you're going to fix to them. And you'll impress your friends at your wonderful display of all your wonderful tropical orchids on your special shelving. Right, then we move on to the really sort of serious indoor grower here, where you've dedicated a room. Now, the first downside of dedicating a room to your orchids is you have to go to that room to see them. And that, to me, is a downer. Yeah, that <laughs> There are other places we'll talk about where you have to do the same thing. You have to go there to see your orchids. On the window sills around your home, you'll see your orchids as you walk around. But if you dedicate a whole room to your orchids, you have to be there to see them. You have to be there to work on them. And you're starting to look at larger volumes of orchids now. That's why you've got a whole room. You have to start thinking about your workload. How are you going to water those? Are you going to have to carry them to a sink in the kitchen? Are you going to have a special place where you can water them built into that room? Um, so, you know, are you going to have your bed moved in and your TV? <laughs> Uh, so anyway, the whole room is something that not many people do, but some people do it because they do want to that specific place where they can totally control the environment, because now you don't have to worry about the curtains and the soft furnishings. If you want higher humidity, well, paint the walls with a waterproof paint, get some laminate flooring, and you can have high humidity. You can have what temperature you want, because it doesn't affect the re rest of the house. With LED lights and other sorts of grow lights, you can have the light levels varying around the different shelving. So it's pretty good control here, and your variety of orchids has now greatly increased. Doing okay here, aren't we? Now, as far as I'm concerned, this goes up to another level. When you talk about a conservatory, you've got the bonuses of the whole room. You can see your plants through the doors to the conservatory, so you get to see them without having to go somewhere special. Yeah, Light levels in a conservatory, you've got the opposite effect of in a house because you've probably got too much. And depending on its aspect, facing north, facing south, if you get sun on a conservatory, you're going to turn it into the Sahara Desert. And it's going to get too hot and too dry. So you'll need to shade straight away, unless it faces north. Yeah. So it's quite important, the aspect. Temperatures, it's going to be too cold in the winter, too hot in the summer. You'll have to take charge of the temperatures. You'll need a heater in the winter. You'll need shading and fans and all sorts to cool it down in the summer. Humidity is in your control. You have the control. Airflow is in your control. You tend to get a fair bit of space. <laughs> and if you get a lock on the door, you can keep your other halves, your pets and your children out. You have the control. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm joking. Uh, they're going to want to come in and see what you're up to. because you, You've been out there for hours messing about. What are you doing out here? Yeah, but that's the beauty of the conservatory. It's still part of the house. You could even possibly have part of the central heating system extended out there. You've normally got ready access to power for all your gadgets. It's a compromise. It's not a greenhouse and it's not in the house. In my opinion, it's pretty good stuff, but then that's how I grow. So, since I moved house, um, I've now got a new conservatory compared with the old one, which you've seen in previous talks probably, or on my YouTube channel. This one has a lot more space. It faces north. So far, no sun apart from some very early morning sun that comes through a hole in the hedge for about half an hour. And that's at like quarter to eight in the morning. So, I've got all my shelving from the other place and scattered it around um, and put my plants I've still got control of higher light and lower light by height so top shelves tend to get a bit more light but not so much so now because this is even light comes in from all three sides and above without the directional light that you get from sun so I've even got a sort of shady shady corner there so uh, <laughs> I can still control that right I've got a heater which is connected up to a circulating fan so that when the heater comes on, the circulating fan comes on as well and stops me getting hot or cold spots and roasting a plant while the ones in the corner stay cold. So they come on together on a thermostat. Um, because you can't mess about in somebody else's 
conservatory drilling holes and hanging wires up and doing all that sort of stuff. I've got an awful lot of mounted orchids. So this was my solution. These are clothing racks, clothes hangers, and they're on wheels. And I put some racks on those and I've now got places to put my mounts, you know. So all is not lost, shall we say. Um, they're on wheels, as I said, so I can move them around. I can move them out of the way if I want to get to a particular shelving area or something like that. Um, and then I've still got the fixed shelves, of course. Um, but they're movable. I put those on those little um, trays that you put your pots on to stop them making dents in the floor. <laughs> I've got a fan that stays on 24-7. I've got a workbench. Um, when I use when I use the workbench, I just put the fan on the floor. I've got my humidifier with its header tank full of RO water, which is on a humidistat, so that comes on when the humidity drops below a level that I've chosen. So I'm quite happy with this. I've got a lot of environmental controls, quite a bit of automation going on, and nowhere near as much as I had to have in the other conservatory, which faced south and was forever roasting my plants constant shading so I'm, I'm 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 automatically having to have low light when i didn't want it so this one's better while we're out here let's just have a quick look at some plants <laughs> this is my um dendrobium primulinum variety laos it's just come into bloom for the first time gorgeous love that one um and i like that as well thank you brian gould for letting me buy that off of you <laughs> emphasis on buy my Dendrobium Jenkins CI has uh, decided to bloom up one end, and that's because of the treatment it had, not this winter, but last winter. It needs a long explanation. My um, Dendrobium infundibulum looks rather nice. So does my Zygopetalum. And my Pabstia has just opened one of its two buds. Pabstia ugosa. It's, uh, Spanish J on the front, I believe. Lovely little blooms. Really sturdy. They're like, so though they're made of plastic. Uh, a lot sturdier than the plant that's sat behind them. Um, and my little Cilogeny Natida has just opened. So just a quick look at some of my blooms that are out at the moment. Right, so back on to conservatories then. For me, they work well because they're attached to the house. I can walk from my lounge and while I'm sitting at my computer, I, my computer desk looks out into the grow room, which because I face north and I at the moment don't need shading, I can also look out the windows into my garden and watch the birds on the feeder and all that sort of stuff. Um, it can be part of the house and made habitable for both plants and humans, but you'd have to go careful with soft furnishings if you're going to bump the humidity up and allow for a much bigger variety of orchids. That's really the key. You can control the light with shading. You can normally get ventilation going in a conservatory. You can get airflow going with fans. You've normally got power. And these can work pretty good and, and set up some pretty good environments. Right, greenhouses. Um, having lived with conservatories for some time, this is something I personally wouldn't want, um, unless it was just to gain masses of space. The thing is, you've got to go out to your greenhouse, and if it's tipping it down with rain, you've got to put your hat and coat on, and it's down the bottom of the garden, and the first thing you're going to want to do is have some gadgets. You're going to want a heater. You're probably going to want some fans. You might want a humidifier, depending on what you're going to grow. And all of that needs power. So you're going to have to make arrangements to get power to your greenhouse. And that needs special heavy-duty cabling, probably buried in the ground with a circuit breaker and all the gadgets, all the sort of things you need to get power down in the greenhouse. Most people have their outside tap on the side of the house. So you've now got to walk up and down to get water or you've got to store it in the greenhouse and therefore you need a method of getting the water down into the greenhouse, possibly plumbing and actually get it permanently installed. Um, unless you have a greenhouse under heavy shading, like under trees, or in the shadow of a hedge where the sun never gets, the sun's going to hit it. And when the sun hits it, you've got the same problem as in a south-facing conservatory, it will turn into the Sahara Desert, and you will need a lot of fuss and bother to stop that being detrimental to the orchid you choose to grow. If you don't want to do all that, grow cactuses. 
probably work well for them. And I think even those can burn under glass in the midsummer sun. Um, but nonetheless, there are an awful lot of orchids that are not going to tolerate our, our summer sun for that three or four months through that glass without some pretty heavy duty shading of some sort or another. And by shading the greenhouse to accommodate, you know, stopping everything scorching through that glass, you've automatically reduced your light level. Yeah. So you, you may not now be able to grow those highlight orchids because you're compromising, back to that word again, between light levels and the effects of the sun on your plants. So these um, polycarbonate um, pre-constructed type greenhouses, put them together with a screwdriver, they're really easy. They're not a bad bet because they've got UV filtration in the polycarbonate and it's opaque anyway or obscure, whatever you want to call it. It's not clear glass. So you've automatically got a bit of shading there. But you know, sh greenhouses can come in all shapes and sizes and like I said before, when is a lean-to greenhouse not a conservatory? Well, in my opinion, it's when you still have to go outside to go in the door. <laughs> if the door's part of the house, it's a conservatory. If you have to go outside, it's a greenhouse. But lean-tos can have a function. That wall is a bonus because it'll absorb heat and give that off at night. But um, yeah, greenhouses for me are not the best bet, but all sorts of shelving and gadgets and functioning. And it's out of the house, a, piece of, a, a place of peace and quiet that you can go to. But what about the orchids? It's supposed to be an orchid talk, isn't it? Well, it's around the subject, but not specifically about the orchids. Yeah? So let's go back to our environments then. Our cloud forests tend to be shady. Constant airflow. You can watch that mist travel up the mountainside and flow over the top. High humidity as a consequence, and they tend to be cool. This is probably one of the hardest environments to recreate. But nonetheless, if you've got a dedicated place, which is not your windowsill in your lounge, you can achieve a cloud forest environment. In my um, conservatory, if I upped my humidistat to 95%, I would create a cloud forest environment. It's cool, I've got airflow, and I would then have the humidity. And it would be perfect for all sorts of pleurothalids, um, Mazda Valias, the Draculas, the Ristrepias, the cool growing Oncidium types, the Odontoglossums. Miltoniopsis would love it. So suddenly I could create a, a very specific environment. But it is a specific environment and it's destined for certain types of orchids. Because apply that environment to other types of orchids and they're not going to be happy. If you put cattleyas in that environment, they're not going to be happy. They'll probably rot for a start. <laughs> so again, a dedicated room, you could create that environment. Yeah, A greenhouse or a conservatory, conservatory, you could create that environment, but you will battle the light levels and trying to keep the heat down. Yeah. So, I say it again, this is probably one of the hardest environments to recreate and maintain, but you can grow some pretty special orchids if you can get that environment in. So, as close as you can get, the compromises will be that it's not perfect, but you want to grow those types of orchids. Yeah, so chances are you'll be in a greenhouse, you'll have heavy shading, you'll have humidifiers, and you'll have fans on, and you will worry every time the sun comes out because it's heating up your greenhouse and you don't want that heat. Because your Mazda Valias and your Draculas and your Restrepias and your other Pleurothalids and your Special Oncidium types and your Miltoniopsis do not want the heat. They want the other three elements but not the heat. And quite honestly I've found that um, some of the Odonts and the Miltoniopsis specifically can actually take a bit more light than a lot of the um, books and ancient scrolls say. And even some Mazda Valias seem to bloom better with a, that bit of extra light. So the compromises you will have to make for creating that environment for those types of orchids is you can't really do it in your home unless you dedicate a room to it. So the compromise you're going to make there is in the home you probably can't grow those sort of orchids very well. But you can have a go. 
Right, the tropical rainforests is where an awful lot of our orchids come from. You know, we're looking at the top part of South America, bottom part of North America, um, India, China, Taiwan, Thailand, Laos, parts of Northern Australia, all the Philippines, all that lot. Tropical rainforests. They have one thing in common, they have a wet season and a dry season. The light levels vary from the floor up to the treetops, so you go from shady to bright. There is airflow. Where you've got warmth, hot air will rise and it will make the air move. As it rises up, some it's got to come in to replace it. They've got good humidity. It's all in the title, isn't it? Rain forest. <laughs> it rains a lot. They do have a drier season, but the amount of water that falls in the wet season keeps them wet. And these are, I'm talking evergreen forests here. Why do they stay evergreen? Because the environment is suitable for the plants and trees that grow in there to maintain their leaves throughout the two types of seasons. So it's never that dry. They might not get as much rain, but it's not dry. They're still humid. They tend to be warm to hot, although there are slightly cooler tropical rainforests. Um, that are still evergreen, but in the main you've got that sort of environment. Now, how easy is it to create that environment? Well, you've got shady to bright. Well, if you're outside and you, if you've got your conservatory or your um, <coughs> greenhouse or even parts of your home, you can do shady to bright. So you can cover the light, can't you? Good airflow, stick a fan on, we've got that covered. Good humidity, ah. <laughs> often that excludes the home but there are orchids that come from tropical rainforests that are tolerant of lower humidity levels yeah so by being a bit picky and choosing and compromising there's quite a selection of tropical rainforest orchids that you can grow in your home and in all those other places and the main reason you can grow quite a few of them in your home with a little bit of adaptation is you've got the temperatures. You don't have to worry about it dropping down to freezing all around your greenhouse tonight because it's your home, it's where you live, it's not going to get cold. So you've got your temperatures, that's your bonus. Now you select your plants to go with those temperatures and depending on where you put them in the home you make adjustments for those other things. Your choices have just gone up quite a bit. So tropical rainforest types of, um, there's a lot of dendrobiums, cattleya types, um, a lot of the oncidium and oncidium alliances. They're, they'll do well in these environments because you've got the temperatures. So choices. Now we get on to deciduous or what I call seasonal forests. Um, why are the trees deciduous? Because they can't support their leaves in the dry season. And that normally is because it is drier than the, than the tropical rainforests and tends to be a bit cooler in the winter. And the higher up the mountainside you go, the cooler it gets. So you've now got shady to bright, but you've got seasonal shady to bright because although you've got from the floor level to the tops of the trees, when the leaves are on, so the plants near the tops of the trees are probably getting quite a bit of light, those down the bottom are not. But when that leaf cover drops, everywhere's a bit bright. But is it? Those type of forests often get quite a bit of mist and stuff like that in, in those cooler times because the humidity's still there from when it was the wet season. Yeah, so it takes a while for that humidity to disperse and those mists to stop. And you often get a strange spring in these forests where it starts to get warmer and the days start to get a bit longer but the humidity's low, so they get a warmer, dry spring. Only for a few weeks sometimes, but it's there and it has an effect on some of the plants. Temperatures in these sort of forests, you're looking at the lower end of intermediate down to cool. And again, that depends on how high up the mountainside you are, basically, or are you in a sheltered valley where it might be a little bit warmer. But it's the very fact that the, the trees are in the main deciduous it's going to be drier and cooler in the winter time and brighter. Now there's quite a lot of orchids that need that seasonal change to actually bloom well. I 
I've got quite a few of those, the, the resting type dendrobiums. And they need to cool down a bit in the winter. They need the brightest light you can give them. And they need to be kept pretty dry throughout that winter period. And um, basically, that's what induces the blooms. It's the change. Yeah. So it, it's quite important to some of those orchids. Um, there are other types of orchids that grow in these seasonal forests. There's... Um, someone at the door now. Sorry about that. <laughs> Parcel for next door as usual. So these types of forests do lend themselves to orchid types that don't need the higher temperatures throughout the year. So maybe not so good in the home unless you've got a cooler room, you know, an unheated room for the winter. And that needs to be a bright room as well to accommodate the, the, the effect of what would be the deciduous season. So bright light, cooler temperatures, if you can do that in a separate room to the rest of your house, then you can have a go at some of those orchids. Um, in the other places, you'd probably be okay, but you might need a separate section, um, especially if you've got warm growers on the go. Um, so there we go. Those are the types of places and some ideas for orchids. And why do we bother with all that lot? Why do we mess about with all these factors, places, fiddling around? Well, we do it so that we can see things like this in and around our home or in the greenhouse down the bottom of the garden, whatever. I've been fascinated by orchids since a very young age. I even had an orchid on my windowsill at college, which is a long time ago. And they've been around the house forever along with other house plants. Now at the moment the other house plants have gone. They faded away as my interest in orchids grew um, to the extent where now I don't have any at all. The only plants I've got inside are orchids and I have a large variety which gives me colours, shapes, different care, um, different watering frequencies they give me an interest and they stop me stagnating. Since I retired, I've often wondered what on earth I would do if I didn't have my orchids and my YouTube channel, combination of the two. I'd probably have gone round the bend by now. I'd be in the loony bin. Um, whatever. But they give me an interest to hold on to. They also provide me with quite a bit of my social life. With the Orchid Society meetings... You know, like today, like we're doing now. Um, committees, you know, I'm on both committees for both orchid societies. You've got meetings there. You've got the socials that go with them. So just by being interested in orchids and growing them and joining in, and in my case, helping out with the societies, I've got an interest. I've got something to get out of bed for. I don't go to work anymore. I'm retired and I need something else. And I'm not an avid gardener. Although I like to have a garden, I'm not an avid gardener. I like <laughs> basically to be in the warm and dry. And so I like my orchids, I like my conservatory, and I like the whole business of growing orchids. So that's why I do it. You may have other reasons, but um, I suspect deep down in there, it's just the beauty and the fascination of the types of plants we call orchids and grow around our homes. So thanks for your time, and now we move on to the awkward bit for me. Any questions? So there we go, back onto YouTube only now, and um, that's it, thrown together, a couple of sparks of ideas elaborated on to produce something you know, that I hope people will enjoy. In a, in a way, there ought to be something for most people there, but what's important for me when I do a talk is that people who grow in the home are included because they are often excluded. We get specialist speakers in talking about possibly just one genus of orchids that you just can't grow in the home. So you've just excluded a large portion. Now, they may still find it interesting, but it's not something they're going to be able to join in with and, and, you know, take away that information that that person given them and use it because they can't grow those types of orchids. 
Now, obviously, there are some orchids that are going to be incredibly difficult in the home, which hopefully I've covered a few of that. And I've deliberately not mentioned too many specifics about orchids because I wanted to sort of go over the, the thoughts there. You know, the, like, like the whole title said, the compromises we have to make and the reasons behind that. And hopefully by incorporating the wild, you can see where the compromises are coming from. Because if that's what these plants should get, and you can't do it, you have to get as close as you can. Therein lies the comprom uh, compromises. So hopefully this is going to be of interest to an orchid society. You can't please all the people all of the time, but I'm hoping to please most of the people for most of the time, which I think is the basic theory of this sort of thing. Anyway, comments appreciated and all that stuff and see you next time. Next time will be tomorrow the 8th and it will be everything in bloom on the 8th. And in amongst that there are some new ones including one new bloomer. Uh, which I, it snuck up on me, I, didn't, I wasn't even sure it had a bud. Anyway, so we've got that to look forward to tomorrow. Um, till then, see you next time. Thanks for dropping by.